Welcome to Valley Viewpoint. I'm Roger Johnson. My guest is Dr. Alden Thompson. He's Professor Emeritus at Walla Walla University here in College Place, Washington. And welcome, Alden, to Valley Viewpoint. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, in fact, that's why you're here today, uh, this book uh, by Timothy Jennings, The God-Shaped Heart, is a book that we'll be talking about today. It came out last year, and I uh, asked Alden to, to read it, and he kindly consented to read this book. And we're going to be talking about this, this book and uh, whether he recommends it to our viewers or not. Alden, I, I can say with, with good faith that I haven't asked you uh, about what you have thought about this book. I do know that when I was looking at my Christianity Today, uh, it was advertised there. Mm -hmm. They uh, feel like they have a book that needs to get out uh, to all Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Alden, you have read the book. I haven't even asked you. Uh, I'm assuming you've read the book. I have, indeed. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. In fact, I've, I've heard um, Tim Jennings in a number of settings. Oh. Um, he is a representative of what one could call the third strand in Adventism, um, the truth about God uh, segment. Um, Maxwell and Provencia are the old names that uh, ring with there. Mm. Um, so that's where he's coming from. He is, is very strong-willed, presents his positions with, with great vigor and enthusiasm. So when we mention Maxwell, uh, maybe unpack that for those that have Graham never heard Maxwell, of Maxwell. Graham Maxwell and Jack Provencia, both deceased now, were teachers at Loma Linda University for, for many decades. And uh, they emphasized a very positive view of God. Um, and you'll find that uh, Tim Jennings is in that same tradition, if we could use the word in that sense. Um, but that is a tradition which is not widely um, affirmed in Adventism. Uh, it's quite interesting that this book is published by Baker, which is an evangelical publisher, because the book typically, well, the book takes a very strident anti-substitutionary uh, atonement view. Um, and typically, Christianity Today, they are, um, you know, more Calvinist, more evangelical. So in, in a sense, it's surprising to see them take on, but uh, it's been very popular, and Dr. Jennings uh, has had uh, itinerary of speaking a uh, number of places throughout the world. So it's, he's catching uh, people's attention. And when you mention even Graham Maxwell, that goes back to Uncle Arthur's Bible stories. Uh, just well, kind of that Uncle tie Arthur in. had four sons, and uh, <laughs> two of them were of this type of theology. Two of them were quite different. In fact, I used to joke with Malcolm Maxwell, who was Graham's brother. And you used to teach with him here, as I remember. used to teach with him here. And I said, my goal is to make it possible for the Maxwell family to discuss theology at a family reunion. But, uh, <laughs> that's not necessarily easy. <laughs> because there was a, a wide spectrum of, of interest. Oh, the, the two, two of them, Lawrence and, uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, who is the other one? Um, Lawrence Maxwell and Mervyn Maxwell were very strong perfectionists, whereas Graham and Malcolm were not. See? So. And we're throwing ar around terms that uh, are possibly out there, even beyond a Seventh-day Adventist understanding. But uh, w talk to us about what are the roots. Uh, first of all, he's a doctor. Maybe we can mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. is, is a doctor inclined toward this type of an approach, as you say? The, uh, how would you describe his approach again? Well, the one area, let me just say the one area where I, I really think he is, uh, where I would like to affirm it, he talks about the two different views of law, uh, design law and then imposed law. Mm -hmm. And design law is that which it's, it's like um, the law of gravity. Um, 
it's just built in. And he wants to see God's law as that way, that it's simply a built-in law, a design law. The over against that is the imposed law, which it comes on top. It's not built from within, but it is imposed from without. And he sees that coming from the influence of the Roman Empire uh, on the Christian understanding of law. And I think that distinction is a very helpful one. Uh, where I think he uh, goes astray, if I could put it that way, is where he, he goes strongly against any idea of substitutionary atonement. Now, at one point he says, the substitutionary impose that an angry God demands a price. See, and I think there are ways of looking at substitutionary atonement which do doesn't see God demanding the price, but sees the human mind as somehow expecting to pay a price. And God recognizes that. And that's why you have sacrificial language, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, because God is adapting to the needs of human families. And I sense that this book also recognizes the, the levels of understanding of maturity and that God was dealing with those first four levels of maturity. <laughs> yes, he has taken Kohlberg's stages of moral development. Which apparently is quite recognized out there, way yes. beyond a, a denominational type of, of approach. In fact, it's, it's a, a fairly sophisticated uh, gradated levels of, seven, of six different levels of moral development. It's similar, it's similar to Foster's book stages of spiritual development. Um, the difficulty with that that I have found is that uh, when you talk about stages of moral development, it's almost impossible to do that without being condescending. For instance, if I say, now, Roger, you know, you're a four, and the Lord needs four in his kingdom, and I'm a six, you know, and, and it's, I've never seen anybody be able to deal with that in a very positive sense. And of course, Tim takes it further and says, at least if I understood him correctly, that the first four levels cannot be saved. See, so you've got to move beyond that fourth level to be able to get into the kingdom. Now, uh, was this understanding of the first four levels m not sufficiently mature enough to be part of the kingdom? <laughs> well, <laughs> is that I think they would say. Part of this book, would you say? Uh, well, he, he would say that uh, those first four levels operate very strongly with imposed law. See. In fact, Dr. Jennings has written an entire New Testament called The Remedy, in which he goes through and, and weeds out all the imposed laws, all the judicial language. See, it's a 12-year 12, 12 project. And, and <laughs> may I ask you, do you have a copy? I'm going to get one because I'm really intrigued. You see, to say that they're um, well, whenever anybody produces a, a Bible translation for a particular purpose, I tend to um, <laughs> swallow hard. <laughs> That's why all major translations of the Bible are committee translations. So you can't have one person just simply taking a hobby horse and riding it through. Even the Living Bible, uh, the Taylor. Uh, Living Bible has now, has become, now the become the new Living Translation. As a committee. As a committee. Uh -huh. They brought on 50 to 60 members, and it's now it's an excellent Bible translation. But uh, the so way. So maybe the remedy <laughs> down the stream of time <laughs> will have, no, have it, a it's, committee. <laughs> it's got too sharp a focus. It, it will mm. not take on any more than the clear word is likely to mm. become a committee. <laughs> translation yeah. either. Yeah. So, so the clear word is similar to the remedy in the sense that someone basically gave a commentary yeah. uh, from, their, from, their from their perspective, filter, from right. their filter yeah. of the way they see the religious world. That's right. Do you see that he's a frustrated doctor in the roots of this book? I happen to have read the first chapter, and, and I've read more than that, but it seems like he's a psychiatrist. He's, he is a psychiatrist. He's a frustrated doctor, isn't he, when he shares those stats of the difference between 
supposedly I don't, Christians. I don't know whether he is. Are, yeah, I don't know whether he is more frustrated than the rest of us. You know, when we <laughs> see things that go astray, but uh, he certainly has given himself wholeheartedly to to theology and finding ways of making that helpful. And he's found ways that have been very helpful to some people. Uh, I happen to have been at the General Conference, the one in Texas, the most recent one, and he had a booth there in which he was sharing, and of course that was well before this book came out, but he shared the God-shaped brain. Hmm. And when I read that book, Th this paradigm of the design law and the imposed law paradigm was in one segment of the book. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be a book dedicated to the, to the full flowering of that paradigm that you mm -hmm. mentioned a few mm -hmm. minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I, I think so. I've not read the other book. Uh, this is the one that I'm most familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I got this copy from Tim. Um, just this last year. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but I, I do think that the idea of design law is a very important one. But I don't think that one can take the, eliminate all references to um, the substitutionary atonement. I mean, there's one section where he quotes Baptists and Pentecostals and Roman Catholics and Adventists, all giving the wrong view of the atonement. I mean, he has them all laid out there. Wrong so. from his perspective. Wrong from his perspective. Mm -hmm. They are taking an imposed law, and this is, of course, where substitutionary atonement comes in, you see. Now, if you try to eliminate all substitutionary atonement, take away all blood references in the New Testament, uh, you'll have a fairly slimmed down New Testament by the time you get through, see. It, it reminds me of uh, some uh, even Thomas Jefferson, I, I believe, tried to write his own New Testament. Am I, am I That's correct? That's right. He has a, a little New Testament, which he took out all the nasty stuff. And it's only 4% of the whole. Oh, is that right? Is yeah. that that small? And he says it's, it's as obvious as, as anything. Huh. Um, that's a typical liberal perspective. You take everything out that you don't like. But if you're going to deal with human beings, you have to deal with people who aren't perfect and ideal. And I, that's the way I deal with the Bible. The Bible, God is dealing with people at different levels, and so you need the whole thing, not just a, a slim-down liberal perspective. We are uh, talking with Dr. Alden Thompson about Tim Jennings' book. It's called The God-Shaped Heart. It came out last year. It's been advertised in, in Christian magazines, as we've talked just briefly. We'll be right back to talk in our second half more about the God-shaped heart. I'm talking with Alden Thompson about the book, The God-shaped heart that came out last year. And uh, we're offering some criticisms and concerns and some possibly some good things about the paradigm of, as you said, the imposed law versus the design, design law. law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how would you, again, remind our viewers what design law is? Design law is, is it's one which is part of the design. So the law of gravity is not an imposed law. It's something that's just the way things work. Um, so could it be typified with God's laws in all the ramifications, not only, not only physics with yeah. gravity, but biological, uh, mental, social, Anything that law. is built in like that. Now, when you go to Scripture, you'll find all kinds of imposed laws as helpful ways. If you take a two-year-old that's out running out into the street, you will deal with him with an imposed law. And uh, so, but it, so it's only possible to have a mature experience and I think that that is ultimately God's desire. I mean, the New Covenant promise, which is actually in the Old Testament, I like the fact that Jeremiah, um, no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. So that is God's ideal 
where it's the, written on the heart and simply that's the way the world works. And so the teaching component is, they've already, as you say, sure. it's been internalized to the point there's no more teaching. <coughs> Ellen White has a fascinating quotation in Mount of Blessings, page 109, when she says, when Lucifer rebelled against the law of God, the idea that there was a law came to the angels almost as something unthought of. Mm. In other words, it had become so much a part of them that when Lucifer says, I don't like the law, they said, oh. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. It's like saying, I don't like the law of gravity. Well, <laughs> yes, but uh, are you going to get rid of it? See, it's, it's, it's part of the way the universe works. That's, that's design law. That's, that's design the law, right. The way it is. Mm -hmm. And the Constantine law, he's typifying in this book, that that was imposed law. Imposed law. Yeah. And he feels that that has permeated both strands, both the Catholic strand and the Protestant strand. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I say the Protestants broke away from the main, sure. main right. body yep. of. And how, so you feel like that that's a, a healthy exercise to explore in our, in our well, spiritual Well, I think life. that is. Uh, mm -hmm. My concern, as I mentioned a few moments ago, is that when you take that idea of imposed law, and there's one phrase here where he says, God is demanding a pound of flesh, so to speak. See, and I think that's often, uh, there are those people who react against the um, substitutionary atonement. Now my own home theology is, is the kind, same kind of theology that Jennings is representing here, and I discovered that in the Gospel of John. And when you say your home theology, that's, that's the comfort of the fireplace and the... And the uh, of the home. different strands of theology, this is the one that roots, you know, and I, I had a question about God when I was in the seminary. If, if the Father loves me, why do I need a mediator? That was the question that I had, see? Mm. Because I had the impression if Jesus is presenting me to the Father, that somehow he had to plead extra hard to get and the father would finally say, all right, let Thompson in the back door. You know, uh, That picture of Jesus pleading his blood to the father <coughs> is the one which um, Jennings is reacting against. And I think that I have probably reacted against that too because when I discovered, based in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is God incarnate, that Jesus came down here, um, he must really want me in his kingdom. See? The so, friend concept. Yeah, the friend concept, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very much Johannine. But what I did then is I found a number of very devout people, very positive in their relationship to God, who did appreciate the substitutionary atonement. They didn't serve an angry God who's demanding a pound of flesh. And so what I've begun doing is memorizing passages of Scripture, Romans 8, for example, which is, uh, has very strong substitutionary language. Um, you go up to chapter seven, the turmoil in chapter seven, then you move into the first verse of chapter eight, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you see. That idea of a price paid, of a substitution, and because it takes me a long time to memorize things, by the time I get through it 35th time or the 95th time, I began to see things that I hadn't seen before. Mm. And uh, there's no question that the substitutionary element is there, but I don't think it has to be something which is demanded by an angry God. I think it is something that is driven from within us. If you go to Micah 6, 6 to 8, you see, um, and you see this especially in the Old Testament where sin really destroys our understanding of authority. And ultimately, that leads to child sacrifice because you think that God is demanding more and more, and finally um, you have um, child sacrifice as the ultimate gift to the gods. You have that, when God asked Abraham, for example, yeah. to sacrifice Isaac, mm. Abraham didn't hesitate at all. It had become the highest gift to the gods. Mm -hmm. So Abraham said, well, everybody else is sacrificing their firstborn son. Why shouldn't I? See. So, so you feel like that had permeated the culture to the point oh, where Abraham ab was 
enculturated to sure. the point where he certainly had to struggle. Uh, I mean, but but it was still well. There's no evidence that he struggled. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you see him in Genesis maybe 18. Maybe I'm superimposing my yeah. own uh, feelings. Genesis 18, um, where you have him arguing over Sodom and Gomorrah with God, and he's not afraid to confront God there and say, uh, you know, you're the judge of all the earth. That's you can't true. do that. See, he in does. Genesis 18, but just four chapters later, God says, I want you to come and sacrifice Isaac. Abraham said, okay. Um, now, I think God was using that as a teaching instrument because when you get up there and he's ready to take Isaac's life, God says, all right, Abraham, you get credit in heaven for your willingness to do this, but you can't sacrifice your son. I will provide the sacrifice for you, you see. And even in some of the strongest substitutionary atonement ones, it is God who pays the sacrifice. He's not demanding that someone else pay the sacrifice. God himself pays the sacrifice. And I think how this psychology works up here in Micah 6, 6 to 8, is an amazing illustration of how the human psychology, which expects to have to pay for things like this, is spelled out. I'll just read it here. Please. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? <clears throat> Goes from bicycle to, you know, to Volkswagen to Cadillac to Lamborghini, <laughs> you know, up there. And it's very interesting. Some modern translations, they insert a no in here. Oh. The Good News Bible, for instance, Implied inserts that, that there's a no, dialogue. No, you can't do that. So, but the, the verse that we're all familiar with is, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you to, but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? See, now God is not indicating a price paid there. See, it's just that what he demands is faithful living. See, um, but it's the human mind that generates this idea. What shall I come before the Lord? And, and you have to, it's kind of like if somebody invites you out to lunch, you have to fear that you have to pay them back and, 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 and uh, invite them out too. So this idea of just simply a gift with no payment, that, that's, that's hard for us to accept. Mm. Would you say that Tim Jennings would say those were levels of one through four that God was having to deal with and describe even with the prophet, even with the prophet, and he's describing levels five, <laughs> six, and seven, and we're not explaining the levels very well to our audience, mm -hmm. but if they, if they receive this book or read it, they will see a, a quite a bit of time mm -hmm. mentioned mm -hmm. on those uh, who originally uh, developed those. Lawrence Kohlberg is the one who developed okay. the, he has six levels, and, yeah. and Jennings has added Jennings. an additional one, yeah. So the, the last verse that you read is levels five, six, and seven. Yes. According to the paradigm. I think that would be Jennings. safe to say, right, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, I'm convinced, that's why I use, in, in my teaching, I use Myers-Briggs, which is um, non-judgmental. You are what you are. And that's why I have resisted the use of Kohlberg and Foster, because it is so condescending, you know. Mm -hmm. Roger, you're only a five, you know. <laughs> Maybe someday you'll grow up to a seven, but uh, and it's just, very angry. So the Myers Briggs is a is a better. Uh, well, Myers Briggs is non judgmental. Non judgmental. Yeah, whatever you are, you're normal. See. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. Yeah. Well, uh, in the last minute or so, uh, would you recommend that those that are watching us uh, would you recommend that this is a helpful exercise? Well. I would recommend it with qualifications okay. because I think there are some good things there. And one of the things we haven't talked about, he has a very helpful concept on homosexuality. Um, you know where Romans talks about laying aside their natural affections? Oh, Romans he, 1. Yes. Yeah, he, he comments that on the typical uh, survey of, of the population, about 1 to 3 percent are homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to Sodom, everybody was looking for, I mean, that's genuine sodomy. That's where the term comes from. So that's really quite a different thing 
than those who struggle with a homosexual orientation. I think that's an intriguing element there. I don't know whether he'll get himself in trouble by <laughs> arguing a more gentle approach to homosexuality, but that certainly is one aspect of the book. Alden, you have, I'm sure, intrigued our audience about the God-shaped heart, and thank you for reviewing this for, for us. And I well, can thank tell you for the been, invitation. I've been uh, in places that I haven't been, but thank you for guiding our viewers in this experience. And thank you for joining us on Valley Viewpoint today. I'm Roger Johnson.